Hi, I'm Stephen Porter. I'm a consultant obstetrician and gynaecologist here at Airtel. Right, well, as a consultant obstetrician, um, I'm mainly involved in looking after pregnant women, uh, usually those that have complex pregnancies. So my job is to ensure the safety of the mother and the baby. Um, so that involves liaison with um, my juniors, obviously, uh, midwives, uh, obviously the, the, the mother herself and her, her partner. Uh, Gynaecology-wise, I do lots of mineral access surgery, so that means keyhole surgery. Um, I have an interest in endometriosis or pel chronic pelvic pain, and also in gynaecology in cancers as well. I'm not from Yorkshire, I'm, I was born and brought up in London. Uh, my parents arrived in the UK in the mid-1960s from Jamaica. Uh, I was born a few years later. Uh, so I grew up in a working class background in East London in the 70s and 80s. And um, I think at that point in time, um, England and Britain was a very different place to what it is at the moment. Um, my mother is a, well, was a nurse, um, so I had some sort of connection to medicine. Uh, but I only really thought about doing medicine myself when I was about eight or nine. Um, but for many years I didn't tell anybody because I didn't really have the confidence to believe that I could become a doctor. Um, so it's only as I began to do really well at school uh, that I began to, be, to believe that I could do medicine. Um, and I think from, from my point of view, it was the, the highest thing I could aspire to be. Uh, so that's really what, what, uh, what, what drove me initially. At the time I was an instructor in an obstetric uh, trauma and life support course. And I would go around the country uh, teaching and lecturing. And on one occasion, um, whilst I was lecturing in Manchester, I met one of my present colleagues, Dr. Graham, and she mentioned this place called Airedale, and she said, oh, well, you know, we've got a job there that you might be interested in applying for. And I thought Airedale meant Ayrshire in Scotland, so I thought that sounds a bit too far north for me. But when I realised it was in Yorkshire, I thought, oh, Yorkshire's not too bad, so I had a look and applied for the job and I got it. Many of my colleagues in London um, have the view that nothing happens outside of London, so when I decided to move up north, uh, they thought I was mad um, and if I'm being honest I wasn't entirely sure I made the right decision um, but when I came up north I was pleasantly surprised by um, how beautiful it was first of all, it was amazing. I like a place of opportunities because um, as I mentioned I do lots of laparoscopic work and when I started here I think there was a, a very um, uh, undeveloped laparoscopic service here so for me there was real opportunity to come here and to do out the service and to um, really do a good job. It's like a family, it sounds like this. it's a bit of a, a, a corny thing to say, but I know most of the porters, most of the domestics, I know all of my consultant colleagues, uh, I know most of the managers. It feels like a very large family. Um, and I like the fact that I'm able, to, that most of the patients I look after will have relatives here. Um, and it, it's, it's just a great place to be. Essentially, um, most of the discrimination that I faced occurred before I became a doctor, so really in my, my childhood and formative years. Um, and that's largely because of the, the time in which I grew up. Um, and most of that was quite overt. Um, so, for example, um, I remember um, I had a very close, extent, well, I had a very big extended family. So my cousins and I were walking down the street, and you'd get people driving past and shouting out, "That nigger bastard!" Uh, when we were like 12, 13, 14 years old, uh, there'd be sort of you know fights with skinheads quite regularly um, at school, <laughs> um, which is interesting. Um, but having said all of that, you know, my overriding memory of that time was a positive one, or well, is a positive one. Um, at school, one of my teachers um, in, in class said to me, well, why do you think you can become a doctor? Um, and this was after I was you know, top of the class, and um, other people who were not as 
not in the same position as me, who were not questioned about what they should do. So things like that happen. But you know, it, to be to be honest, I think we all have challenges. When you work out ways of negotiating um, your way through life, and I think for me, um, growing up in the 70s and 80s as a young black male, got lots of stereotypes that were not particularly positive. Um, but you know, you don't you don't make those things your your prison. You, you look you see them for what they are, and you move beyond them. And I think the important thing for me was having a focus and knowing what I wanted to do, and not being distracted um, by whatever some people happen to think. Sometimes the better things get, the less people tolerate the imperfections. And I think with, with the whole racism side of things, um, there's no one alive today certainly in the UK, who's having a worse time racially than people did 20, 30, 40 years ago. And yet there's a lot more um, uh, attention directed towards race. Um, so, you know, my, my, my view is that, you know, it's not a question of whether racism exists, the question is, is it able to be the major determinant of your, your, your life chances? And the answer to that is no. Um, not unless you let it. Really. It's only as a, a man in his middle middle years, shall I say, um, that I've realised that you know that the biggest limitation we face is that are those we put on ourselves. And that sounds really corny, but it's absolutely true. Um, I think as a young person, you know, certainly today, there's so many opportunities available, um, and the question is, will you make, take advantage of them? In terms of other inspirational characters, there are so many. Um, there's a chap called Ben Carson, who is a black paediatric neurosurgeon, well, he's a retired neuro neurosurgeon in the States. Um, and he wrote a book called Gifted Hands, a quite a modest book by himself. <laughs> anyway, and um, one of the nice things that he, he mentioned in that book was all the people that had inspired him. And he, and he, he undertook an exercise where he sat down one day and wrote down all the people that helped him along the way. And I did the same thing a few years ago and found that there were probably 30 people I could think of who really helped me, uh, from teachers to uh, people at my church when I was younger, uh, who just spoke words of encouragement or, in some cases, words that I didn't particularly like at the time, um, but were nonetheless very, very beneficial and inspirational. Um, so there are lots of people like that. Um, and I suppose my mum, my mum has been a huge huge character. I mean, my mum's a fantastic woman. Um, I think I really won first prize in life's lottery when it came to mum because she, she's just, um, she's been everything in terms of encouraging and supporting and nurturing and uh, just, just great. And when you, you know, I think about my mum um, and my father for that matter uh, and that generation uh, and the generations that went before them, th their loss in life was much worse than mine has been. Um, and much worse than those of my children. Um, and yet these were people that just got on with life. Um, and again, race aside, you can argue that, you know, even in this country, the, the, the war generation were much more resilient than the generations that followed because they just got on with life and recognised that it wasn't, it, it, it didn't have, it's not going to be perfect. I think part of the problem that we have today is that we are so comfortable in general that we are very intolerant of discomfort. And, that, and I think that that informs a lot of our, our suffering. Um, so I think if we kind of think, actually, do you know what? It's not that bad, or I can I can I can continue with this, or I can do it another, try another way, then then it'll make things a bit easier for us. When I was very young. Um, I made a decision to become a Christian, as it were, to um, try to you know, live in a way that pleased God. Um, haven't always done that, but tried. Um, but I think for me, what's been very important about my faith, as it were, as a Christian, is that there is an acknowledgement that there is something beyond myself. So it's not just about me and my family, um, but I acknowledge that there is a, a God, um, and that you know what I do is I'm accountable to Him. And also, I think it's helped me a lot in terms of how I deal with other people because um, if I really believe that you know we are. You know, we're all God's creations. Uh, but I have to respect everybody, regardless of what they look like, what they think, 
what they do, and that informs my my approach to to everybody. Um, and that's been really helpful, particularly you know when people have been particularly unkind or uncharitable, shall I say. Um, but I thought, actually, you know what? Um, this person is of equal value to myself. Um, I only know a fraction of their life. I don't know what's led them to where they are. Um, I don't know where they're going to go from here. One of the, the key aspects of it is, is forgiveness, uh, being forgiven for things that you've done wrong, but also forgiving others. And I think when you yourself have been forgiven for something, you're able to forgive other people. Um, and that's been helpful just in terms of me not holding stuff. Um, you know, particularly, like I said, when I was younger and people would, would, uh, would say and do things that were not particularly nice and, and it's just enabled me to, to forgive them because I think one of the things I find isn't spoken about very much, but I think it's very important, is the whole idea of forgiveness because I think, you know, I'm not saying we should, we should um, overlook slights or hurts or whatever, but I think when we take them in and when we hold on to them, the damage is done to ourselves. If anything, I go out of my way to help people who I feel may be um, disadvantaged or overlooked because I know that that's what they probably need. Um, and I'm also trying to override my own internal biases. And it, it goes back to what I said before, Anne, about um, how I see people and, and seeing everyone of equal worth. To reiterate what I said beforehand in terms of you know, people not being, not placing limits on themselves, whatever those limits are due to, um, and you know if there are obstacles that you, that you come across, um, trying not to be defeated by them and just thinking, okay, I can work around this or under it or over it, uh, but there, there must be a way beyond it.